Welcome as we continue this spring jazz season and uh, the first lively arts conversation of the season. Tonight, um, well, I actually am not going to do the introduction. I'm going to bring out our host, Rodney Wittenberg. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rodney Wittenberg. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Just a little uh, bit of housekeeping. Um, tonight, we're going to talk to Terrence mainly about film composing and what that, uh, what that work looks like and what it takes to score film and how he got into scoring film. We'll talk a little bit about his early career and we'll also look at, if we have time, um, we're gonna look at uh, his latest recording and the band that you're actually gonna hear later tonight. Uh, as we'll, we'll have a conversation for about 30 minutes, uh, 35 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the floors for some questions. So, is everybody good with that? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so without any further ado, I would like to introduce to you multi-Grammy award-winning trumpeter and composer, Terrence Blanchard. Hey. 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 How you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. Good. All right, so. How are you? <laughs> good. All right, so let's get right into it. So, uh -huh. um, how did music come into your life? I know oh. your dad was a part-time or amateur opera singer or something. Yeah, or? I mean, I think I came into music's life before it came into mine, because mm -hmm. uh, it always existed in my house and my family. My father uh, studied opera from the time that he was a kid. Um, my uh, mom's sister taught piano and voice. My grandfather played at the guitar. And my grandma, mm -hmm. even though she wasn't a singer, she'd hum hymns all mm -hmm. day long. Mm -hmm. um, so there was never a moment where there wasn't music in the house or, 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 or even appreciation for music. Because uh, if, we were, if something came on the radio or if we were watching television and somebody came on, whether it be opera, jazz, whatever, my father would be like, hey, come here, come here, sit down. Mm. You know, and he'd give me the lecture. See, what you listen to, that ain't music. See, that's music. Right there. <laughs> yeah. And what would he be, uh, what was something that he might have played for you back Oscar then? Oscar Peterson. <laughs> if Oscar Peterson came on at tonight, show, he said, hey, boy, get in here. <laughs> and I, I said, oh, damn it, here we go. <laughs> and I would sit down, and he go, and I already liked Oscar Peterson, so I don't know why he would do this to me. He would say, listen, look, look, look at his touch. See, he's not banging on the piano. See, he has technique, you know, or if, um, mm -hmm. It was Pavarotti was singing mm -hmm. on the on the uh, t the Tonight Show one time. Uh, I remember he called me in. Same thing, mm -hmm. you know. For him, you know, it was about the art and about the craft. You know, he used, always used to talk about diction and mm. sound and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, actually, I'm going to jump around to a question because what you just said leads me to that question. Uh, so, growing up with a very supportive family and in support of your musical development and career, how do you think that helped you? And how did it support you? And, and, and also, maybe how did it get in your way? It was a weird existence, man, because the whole support thing is kind of iffy, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because my father loved me too much, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid, growing up, man, they took me to meet my aunt, would take me to music camp every summer, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I had piano lessons every weekend, trumpet lessons. Um, if there was a musical event or a master class or anything, I was all, you know, this, they took me to everything. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very supportive because, you know, they would question me. Mm -hmm. You haven't been practicing, you know. <laughs> I remember my dad, he sold insurance and he would have like a pocket full of change all the time and uh, keys. And uh, as soon as he would hit the door, you could hear it. Mm -hmm. As soon as I'd hit that ching -ching, that, that chingling from the keys, I go, oh damn, here he comes, <laughs> and and uh, he would come in the back, and I was a kid, man. I'd be watching cartoons, mm -hmm. and he said, hey man, you got a recital in three months, you should be practicing. I'm like, no, you just said it was three months away. <laughs> 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 it's not tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, but the, it really got real for my father when I graduated. Mm -hmm. You know, he wanted me to stay in Louisiana. Mm. He wanted me to, he just, you know, he just wanted me to be near him, basically. Um, and they didn't understand how 
uh, a, a kid who got an, uh, a full scholarship to an Ivy League school mm -hmm. um, would leave school to go play with somebody they'd never heard of. Mm. See, when I was playing with Lionel Hampton, mm -hmm. they knew who that was. Mm -hmm. They didn't know who Art Blakey was. Wow. And, yeah. And because my father wasn't into modern jazz. He mm -hmm. was in like the swing era mm -hmm. and operatic music. And mm -hmm. the bebop, Charlie Parker, no, that wasn't, he said they played too many notes. That was, <laughs> that was his thing. Um, so uh, when I left school to play with him, you know, me and my father had it out. He said, he uh -huh. told me, yeah. He said, you're not my son. My son wouldn't do anything that's stupid. I never forget it. But mm -hmm. when I made my first record with our art, I brought it home. Uh, and oddly enough, the, the tune that I had written became the title track. Mm -hmm. So it was called Oh By The Way. Mm -hmm. And um, I gave it to my dad, and he didn't really say, say nothing. But <laughs> my dad had friends who were jazz musicians. You mm -hmm. know, and there was one guy named Clem Turvalon, who was a trombone player. Uh, he had saw Clem, and he goes, Clem, my boy done lost his mind. And he said <laughs> he's in left school to go play with somebody named Art Blakely. And uh, my dad called me, <laughs> I'm going to forget it. He said, man, Clem, tell me this Art Blakey is somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I tried to tell you that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you started off playing piano at age five. And then after hearing Alvin Acorn, you switched the trumpet. What was it about the trumpet that spoke to you? Man, it sounded like a voice. Mm. You know, there was vibrato, there was expression, you know. And I just remember, like it was yesterday, I was a little kid sitting on the floor in the cafeteria, man, and this guy is just playing his horn, and I kept going, wow, what, why, he, you can't do that on the piano, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I went home, and my dad just rented a piano for me to have at the house. Yeah. <laughs> you know, kids don't know the economics of life. Uh -huh. uh, when I told them I wanted to play the trumpet, whew, that was an interesting day. Uh, what happened? He just went off. Uh, <laughs> He's like, boy, uh, he pointed at the piano. He's like, <laughs> you see what just arrived here? Mm -hmm. You know, but they were still cool. Mm -hmm. um, when got me a trumpet. Mm. And the odd thing about it, you know, we saw Alvin Alcorn a few years later mm -hmm. at, a, at a stoplight mm -hmm. in New Orleans. Mm. And uh, we must have talked really fast, because now that I think about it, there was a lot of information that went back and forth. Because I said, Dad, that's the guy, that's the guy. He's the reason why I play the trumpet. He goes, oh, that's Al. And he rolls down the window. And I'm like, you know him? And he goes, hey, Al. And Al rolls down. He said, hey, Al, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And he said, Al, my, my boy's playing trumpet. He goes, oh, that's nice. And I got excited because my dad said, hey, man, he wants to learn how to play jazz. You think you could teach him? <laughs> and then Al goes, no, nah, he got to learn how to do that for himself. <laughs> I was crushed, dude. I was really crushed. I was crushed. But, you know, I mean, the older I got, mm -hmm. Uh, the more I started to realize, that was probably the best thing for me to hear. Mm -hmm. You know, that you got to go out and work for it. Nobody's yeah. going to give you anything, yeah. you know. So that leads me to my next question. You talk about the support of your family, but what about the support of the city? Like, well, like, I can, I've met a number of musicians, mm -hmm. got to talk to from New Orleans, did uh -huh. a PBS special with Trombone Shorty. And okay. There's nothing like musicians from New Orleans. So what is it, what was that city like for you? It's family. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. I mean, once you enter into it, I'll never forget it, man. You know, my family wasn't the type of lovey-dovey, lovey, lovey -dovey, mm -hmm. like, I love you, you hug me, all kind of, we weren't like that. Uh -huh. And I'll never forget, man, I was, went up to uh, hang out, James Rivers was playing at this club called Tyler's, and I was about 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Herlin Raleigh was the drummer, and I went and sat up, sat in with the band. They called me up to play. Mm -hmm. And I played a little bit, man, and then uh, I'll never forget, James Rivers came over and he was just, he said, oh man, you sound good. And he gave me a hug mm. and then gave me $10. Well, first, that was the first time a man had hugged me. Uh, you know uh, what I mean? Uh -huh. And I was like, wow, that was an interesting sensation. And it made it feel like family. Mm. Like this guy was like taking me. And I don't know how to explain it, but mm. it's like all of a sudden I felt like I was in with those guys, mm. right? And then the $10 was kind of cool, too. <laughs> uh, uh, was that the first time you got paid? Oh, yeah, man. I was trying <laughs> to come back every night, man. Shit. Um, but, but, but the other part of it, too, is that when uh, <clears throat> Wenton and Branford Donald and myself mm -hmm. were coming along in high school, mm -hmm. man, we were always supportive because we all went to different regional schools. 
you know, but we were always the ones who really wanted to play jazz, you mm -hmm. know. So Willie Metcalf had a summer music program, and we'd all be there during the summertime. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, man, I, you better be practicing, bro. I hope mm -hmm. you're practicing, you know, mm -hmm. doing that kind of thing. Uh, man, I don't want you out here. I don't want to see you out here doing no craziness. You know, we we always talk to each other mm -hmm. in in that realm. Um, so that part of it was supportive too. And then just the community itself, you know, was always just trying to push you ahead, mm -hmm. you know, make you go further. Yeah, yeah. as a matter of fact, come here, let me show you this. Oh, you don't know about this? Mm. He said, you know, that happened all the time. Mm -hmm. Kid Jordan, Ellis Marcellus, Roger Dickinson, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Johnny Fernandez, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the uh, Clyde Kerr. Mm -hmm. There were so many musicians, man, that whenever we hung around them, it was like getting a lesson mm -hmm. all the time. All the time. And, it was, and I shouldn't say a lesson, because that's the wrong word. The lesson makes it seem like it's something formal. Mm -hmm. It was like these guys talked about stuff because they were music nerds. Mm -hmm. They didn't look like it. They yeah. kind of look hip, or whatever, but they were music nerds. Mm -hmm. you know? So when you got together, you just start talking yeah i mean like music. you know like i remember doing a gig with clyde kerr and mm -hmm. you know and somebody plays something and goes oh man isn't that that herbert l clark studies man you know that but i used to play that blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah you know that kind of thing uh -huh. and then it would just go into a whole type of conversation about technique mm -hmm. and and learning um and doing some type of characteristic studies mm -hmm. for the trumpet yeah and i just used to be a fly on the wall dude i just just soaked it up oh yeah, yeah i read uh in oh i guess it was on your Page, when you first went to summer camp, that you were struggling with the trumpet. It wasn't like you weren't as proficient. Oh no, no, no! What I was talking, yeah, what I was talking about. No, well, me and Went were the saddest dudes in the camp. <laughs> really? Oh yeah, we were in elementary school, man. I was going to fifth grade, he was going to sixth grade, and we had the last two seats in the wind ensemble. I mean, the last two oh, seats. No. Yeah. So our music, I was making a joke. I said our music had nothing but rest in it. <laughs> <laughs> we sit there and talk to each other. Damn, so what you was doing yesterday, bro? <laughs> oh, bro, we got a... Uh, yeah, so what was happening? <laughs> you know, that's what I was talking about. Okay. You know, yeah. it was pretty fun, though. Was it easy to... I guess it was easy to get gigs, so it was easy... Was it easy to make money playing back then when you were younger? Not, not six, but in yeah. sixth grade, but when you were like in your I wasn't. Teens? I wasn't doing jazz gigs. I used to play in an mm -hmm. R&B band called mm -hmm. The Creators. Mm -hmm. uh, when in Bradford were in the band before me, but they were playing... Mm -hmm. uh, their instruments, but when I joined the band, mm -hmm. I was mostly the keyboard player, mm -hmm. and I played the uh, trumpet as well, a little mm -hmm. bit, one I doubled with the other guy. Um, so I was doing that to make money, so mm -hmm. I wasn't going out, and then there were some other gigs that I would take. Mm -hmm. There was a group, it was called the Daishiki Theater. Mm -hmm. um, they would do some productions every now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, and oddly enough, I wound up playing, playing piano on one of their productions. I can't remember what it was, mm -hmm. but I remember Ellis couldn't do it, and mm -hmm. they asked him if he had a student who could do it. And Ellis was trying to make me a piano player back then, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So he said, "Hey, man, why don't you take this thing for me? I can't do it. You know, it'll pay this." And I went, mm -hmm. "How much? <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, it's good to have other skills." So, I remember the first film that I saw that really, the, the score really struck me. It was uh, Goofy, uh, Alfred Newman's score for uh, Airport in mm -hmm. 1970. 69, and Sounder, which was Taj Mahal, and Roots. Both of the, I mean, those really made me go, oh, I want to do that. What was that for you? What, what was it that you wanted to do film? Oddly, oddly enough, uh, it's when I worked with Spike, man. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was watching his father do it. Mm. That's, um, I, I didn't even know there was a career for it, you know? And we got to do, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, was it not school days, but do the right thing and uh, the Mo Better Blues? Mo Better Blues, yeah. So it was watching him do that. I kept saying, "Man, this is kind of that must be a cool kind of gig to mm -hmm. sit there and watch a picture and write music to it." And when we were doing while we were doing Mo Better Blues, that's when I was playing the piano. And mm -hmm. Spike asked to use what I was playing, and then it turned into a career. So there was, you didn't have a preconceived idea that you wanted to enter into film no, scoring? No, was, indeed, no, indeed. Spike asked you to do it, and yep. there you were. Yeah. What was but that? See the thing, but here's the thing, though. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to compose. I had mm -hmm. been studying composition, mm -hmm. and I always wanted to, I always saw myself writing larger pieces of music for larger ensembles. Mm -hmm. So that was always in the back of my mind. Mm. So at that time, you had just embarked on your solo career. Your solo record was going great. 
and here comes Spike saying, hey, can you score a film for me? What was going through your mind? What was that like? What was that period <laughs> like for you? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I always laugh about it now, but I kind of like those oh shit moments, you know, <laughs> because that's when you could either jump on the train or just stand on the side. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always been wanting to jump on the train. I don't even know where the train is going, but mm -hmm. for some reason, I like the adventure. So when he asked me to do it, I looked at it as an opportunity. And um, I said, of course. And when I was doing Jungle Fever, I didn't think he was gonna call me to do Malcolm X. Mm. You know, I thought he was getting, he was finding some interim guy mm -hmm. to do work <laughs> until he found some big name guy to do the big film, because mm -hmm. Jungle Fever was a smaller yeah. movie. Uh, but man, so we finished Jungle Fever and then he went right into Malcolm X and then he said, hey man, I want you to do, do mm -hmm. when he called me to do that one, I, you know, I started to do a lot of homework. I started listening to some scores. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he loved the score to glory, mm -hmm. uh, James uh, Newton Howard. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, Spartacus uh, was another one that he loved. Mm -hmm. And then I was listening to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah which none of that stuff I could use. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but um, I did a lot of homework mm -hmm. and I learned a lot in that little moment in time. But that's the way I, I still carry myself, man. You know, I remember uh, Dave Grusin asked if I would play on one of his scores. Mm -hmm. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, mm -hmm. uh, I look at it, a film composer where I don't have to deal with the headaches of dealing with a director none of that stuff, but mm. I could sit there and watch this guy score mm -hmm. and learn from him. Yeah. I'm like, sure, hell yeah, I'm gonna be there. So, how much of your early composing was dependent on technology and how much was you sitting with a piece of paper? And in fact, talk about how you compose jazz versus how you compose music for a film and then talk about the technology piece. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, mm. I always look at it as being the same. Mm -hmm. You know, because the craft of composition is the same. The intent of the music is what changes, mm -hmm. you know. So if I'm writing stuff, some of the stuff that you guys will hear us play tonight, um, there's a certain intent behind it. So, and, uh, and then I understand the genre and the style behind it. Mm -hmm. So I understand the format in terms of how you write melodies and have structures for improvisation, right? So I get that. Mm -hmm. But film is a different thing. So while I may develop a melody in a song for my band, if I'm developing a theme, I may use some of the same techniques, mm -hmm. but I may be free of the constraints of dealing with structure like I deal with, with mm -hmm. my band, right? So that's kind of like the technical mm -hmm. differences, but the intent is the main difference mm -hmm. because in film, if I'm writing something, I have to deal with tone, color, and speed, mm -hmm. right, and, and talk about well, how do we want to deal with this scene? What are we trying to do? Are we going counter to the scene? Are we trying to mm -hmm. deal with some kind of other agenda that's lurking between mm -hmm. the entire film? Mm -hmm. You know, all of those types yeah. of things. Um, and that's, that's more of a, for me, that's more of a conceptual thing mm -hmm. than, a, than a technical thing because the technical, technical side of it is, okay, cool, but in order for me to create that di dissonance, mm -hmm. dissonance, I need to do this, which would be the same thing I would do if I needed dissonance right. in the tune, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but what started to happen was, you know, I started getting into the technology because <laughs> it made it a lot easier, you know. Uh -huh. um, even though I, at the beginning I still like to write with pencil and paper. Uh, now if I'm writing a film, I don't use pencil and paper that much. Mm -hmm. I do it in the computer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still use describing in the computer. Mm. You know what I mean? So what, do you, what programs do you use? Uh, digital Performer yeah. is my main thing, and then I have mm -hmm. you know, all of the plugins, and mm -hmm. I use Vienna Ensemble to tie my computers together. Mm -hmm. um, but I always tell, I always make my kids try to write out by hand, because mm -hmm. I'm doing it at a computer because I have the experience of doing it the other way, mm -hmm. you know? And when I'm looking at it, uh, when I'm looking at the, the, the page in the scribe view, I'm still relating to it like it's... On paper. Like yeah. it's paper. Um, but, you know, listen, man, I use all the technology for all of it that mm -hmm. it has to offer. I look like everything has weaknesses and strengths. Mm -hmm. You know, the key to it is, is not trying to get something to do something that it's not strong at. Mm -hmm. So I don't look at trying to use samples to try to recreate 
orchestras. I have a huge library that mm -hmm. I use for writing, mm -hmm. right? And then I'll send out demos and stuff. But I always try to make sure that we record those with real musicians, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. It's just a thing for me because mm -hmm. one, one, it, the thing that I love, and that maybe it comes from my background as a jazz musician, mm -hmm. one of the things that I love about the creative process is the collaborative portion of it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, I'll write something, but then when the guys start to play it, they'll yeah. play it in a way that I wouldn't have conceived of. Mm -hmm. And then when you get like 40 strings in one room, mm -hmm. there's something that, that happens with the overtone series yeah. in that room based on how the chords change. Yeah. Whereas when you press a key, it, that overtone series doesn't do anything. It's yeah. just a recording of it. So, yeah. you know. But on the other side of it, too, then I like to use electronic instruments for what they have, different type of sonic textures and colors. Mm -hmm. You know, I create my own loops. You know, mm. uh, I put them in, make Rex files and put them in a stylus. Mm -hmm. You know, I do a lot of things with using a lot of different types of effects. I have a lot of plugins. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I'm into sound design mm -hmm. on that side of it too. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't try to get one thing to do the other's job. Right. Did you find it was, uh, I guess before that you were already working with computers and you're composing, so making that transition into film composing, was it, was it challenging to learn all the new technology? Or oh was yeah, it? man, it's always challenging to learn it because it's like, it's like anything else. It's challenging to learn it because as soon as you get it, you feel like you gotta use it. Yeah. <laughs> and you may not have to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You feel like, oh man, I can't hear this reverb that I bought. Let me turn, <laughs> turn it, it up. Yeah. You know, and everybody mm -hmm. gets it and goes, man, what the hell is that? Yeah. You know? Um, so I've, the, 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 the crucial part of it is um, learning the subtleties of mm -hmm. it, just like anything else. Yeah. It's the same thing with playing the trumpet. First thing, you know, people think about is the trumpet is a racetrack, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Because that's the first time most oh, people heard a bugle, yeah. you know uh -huh. what I mean? Um, and they think of it as being a brass instrument. Mm -hmm. But in order to play with subtlety, you know, you have to deal with a lot of control and mm -hmm. work at it, yeah. you know, and really focus on it. So it's the same thing with the electronic stuff. Cool. So um, I noticed that there's this amazing relationship between composer and director. And, you know, there's Howard Shore and Martin Scorsese, David Cronenberg and Peter Jackson, Spielberg and Williams and you and Spike. Wh what is that relationship about? You being on the inside of the one that you have with Spike, he keeps coming back to you time and time again. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of why? And talk about a little bit about how you guys work together. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a connection uh, that you have with a person. You know, um, I know exactly what, he, what it is he's trying to do. I, you know, we had a couple of conversations when I worked with him on Jungle Fever about mm -hmm. what it is that he liked. Mm -hmm. And every film I would try to push the envelope, but mm -hmm. he's very consistent mm -hmm. in what it is that he likes. Sometimes I would send him themes that are a little atonal, mm -hmm. you know, and he goes, no, nah, I don't want that. You know? <laughs> so he would, he would respond the same way every time. Mm -hmm. So, but the other part of it too is that, you know, um, I, I guess obviously he likes what it is that I write, mm -hmm. but I think um, he also can depend on me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like I always tell people, that's, I was telling somebody the other day in the interview, I said, man, listen, when a dude puts that much trust in you, mm -hmm. you don't want to like let him down. Mm -hmm. So, because one of the things people don't know when I work with Spike is that um, some other directors I work with, I have to make mock-ups using samples yeah. and stuff so they can hear what the orchestra is going to sound like. Mm -hmm. They want to get a sense of it. Man, I just did it this morning because uh, mm -hmm. we were getting ready to work on this next film. I sent him three um, I sent him four themes early and I sent him three themes this morning and mm -hmm. it's just on piano. Mm -hmm. And that's just how he likes to hear it. And he's coming down to New Orleans uh, probably tomorrow. Mm -hmm. and we're going to work on Monday going through the film to spot it. We did the spotting session. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to go through the themes and we're going to assign the themes to scenes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then once he's comfortable with that, he doesn't want to hear nothing until we get to the stage. Really? Wow. Yeah. No mock-ups? You don't, nope. you don't, do you um, watch the film in your oh, yeah. when you're oh, yeah. scoring it, mm -hmm. but you send him nothing? And nothing. He doesn't want to, he, he want, his thing is, and I get it, which is some brave shit, but it, <laughs> makes, it makes me work hard, you know, to like, I go over things like, a lot. Because, <laughs> you know, his thing is, he wants to hear it like the audience is going to hear it for the first time. So, mm. wow. he wants to hear it with the live musicians, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have to confess, I am such a fan of your film scores, oh, and 
uh, it's like a big fanboy moment for me to be oh, here no, talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, so I won't gush too much, <laughs> too much. No, right. But yeah. um, my favorite piece that you, and I want to play just a little bit of it, is sure. the opening theme, the 25th hour. And I wanted you to talk oh, wow. a little bit about that. Okay. But it so captures the tone, just like the film does, the tone right after 9-11 in, yeah. in, in New York. Mm -hmm. But um, can, can we play a little bit of that, just a little bit of the score, for the, the title theme? <laughs> Turn it up a little bit. How did you, did, what was the conversation you had with Spike when you were talking about the opening scene and where did that come from? How, how, like well, again, he only heard that melody on the piano. Mm -hmm. um, but when I saw the images of those two lights, mm -hmm. you know, it broke my heart, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I used to live in New York. I lived in New York for 15 years. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, when I, a friend of mine we used to ride our bikes in the Manhattan from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. You know, we would ride through the World Trade Center and the security guards would chase us, you know, <laughs> you know like I was 15 years old or something. But we used to do that for fun. And when I saw that and I thought about it, 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 it hurt a great mm -hmm. deal. And when you watch the movie itself, you know, Spike used all of the visuals of New York after 9-11 as another character mm -hmm. in the film. And he kept telling me, his conversation to me was, we want to remind people that this is post 9-11 New York. Mm -hmm. So I thought, um, I want to get an Arabic voice and some percussion mm -hmm. and bagpipes. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. bagpipes are not there, they come in later on mm -hmm. in, a, in a film. Mm -hmm. um, and the bagpipes were to represent, obviously, NYPD and NYFD. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest of it was just about like trying to set the mood, the way the shot starts with that dark, mm -hmm. like that, yeah. you know, it, to me that just seems like something is just very still. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the percussion have to have a presence, mm -hmm. so they need to play something. So I just wanted them to play something minimal that had a little pulse to it, mm -hmm. but mainly it was just to have uh, just tone, mm -hmm. and then to give space for the vocalist to, so there's a moment that comes up after that <coughs> where uh, the orchestra gets really big. Mm -hmm. I forgot the guy's name who was, who was singing, man, but he mm -hmm. just improvises. Mm, okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. yeah. And as a matter of fact, yeah. um, um, man, this guy was so amazing. Mm. Um, there were some other moments we used him in the film, and we just told him, hey, man, just <laughs> go. Just improvise. Yeah. It's yeah. like we all, me and Spike have a motto. It's like if you got Michael Jordan on your team, don't sit him on the bench. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when you went into the studio to record that, you had that main theme um, that starts off, uh, I guess it starts off with the piano and then moves to the yeah. cello, and, yeah. so, and then you just had him improvise. Yeah, well, he sings the melody at some points, uh -huh. you know, but then he, on other points, he's just yeah. improvising. And when he sings the melody and it goes real high, high man, he just opens up, and mm -hmm. it's really cool. And, and I remember the other thing that I used there, because I loved it so much of Malcolm X, was cello. Mm -hmm. Because to me, cello, there's mm -hmm. something about the, for me, mm -hmm. there's something about the sound of the cello that relates to the human voice. For mm -hmm. me, Similar know? to the trumpet. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's when I, that's what I wanted to use. Uh, uh, against the uh, the Arabic voice, mm -hmm. I love the the the, con the the counter line that happens with the Arabic voices as the the theme is moving along, mm -hmm. and then when it moves into that, you get that pause. Like the whole thing reminds me too of a little bit of Caravan and okay, yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. it <laughs> I could gush on all that, no, 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 no. <laughs> but it's yeah. just, it it reminds me it has sort of that ja a, a, a jazz. Um, mm -hmm. Middle Eastern feel, but as soon as it goes into the big strings, yes. it feels like a classic Hollywood score, oh, like from you. from like an old school, like an Alfred thank Newman you. or thank like you. an old school Hollywood score. And it's so evocative and big and 
lush, mm -hmm. which is all the things you don't get anymore in film school. I mean, one of the things that I love about your work is, is thematic. Most, right. a lot of film composers do a lot of orchestration. Right. There's a lot of noise, there's right. a lot of, but very few still do themes. That's Spike, that's all Spike. Mm -hmm. That's all Spike, because you know, when I first got in the film, I was like everybody else. I wanted to be, you know, the hip guy to write the chords that you can't describe. You know. uh, but Spike was like, no, 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 man. I want some thematic stuff. He's, and his, his thing he used to say to me all the time uh, is that I want people to walk away from the theater humming the theme, mm -hmm. you know. But in terms of the orchestration, thank you for that compliment because it's something that I've always like tried to pay attention to because when I entered into this. Uh, world, I didn't want to be the jazz guy that tried to write for orchestra. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Uh, for me, my composition teacher was the one who used to tell me, he says, listen, man, you bring your, you bring your background as an artist to the arena of writing for orchestra. There is no classical music, mm -hmm. so to speak. It was all based in folklore. Mm -hmm. Stravinsky's music is based yeah. in mm -hmm. Hungarian folklore. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you have to, he said, the thing about it is writing for orchestra is where you take things and you take those ideas and expand mm -hmm. on those ideas. And what you need to learn is how to notate the phrasing and the rhythm. Mm -hmm. So that's where, with, with all of the things that I do in film, I don't look at it as just like, oh, I need to write, because like, I love Stravinsky, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm kind of like, no, I don't need to write like that. Mm -hmm. Let me figure out, you know what? I know in my world, these rhythms are hip, I like these kind of things. I like this kind of harmony and mm -hmm. this kind of motion. Let me put these together to see what it will sound like mm -hmm. with an orchestra. Mm -hmm. And mm. I think I think that's what I don't know, but I, I think that's what a lot of composers have done. And that, those are the things that kind of distinguished them from others. Miles mm -hmm. Goodman was my mentor in the film mm -hmm. business, mm -hmm. and uh, Miles, I asked him for some lessons. Man, mm -hmm. I said, "Why don't you show me some stuff?" And Miles said, "No, I'm not going to do that." Mm -hmm. He said, because if I do that, you're going to sound like everybody else in Hollywood. Mm, and he yeah. told me, he said, your weaknesses are your strengths. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand that for the longest time. I was pissed at him. I was like, <laughs> damn, dude. <laughs> you don't me want out. me to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so now you're a film composer, yes. and you're starting to work with other filmmakers, uh -huh. other directors. What was that experience like? Uh, and how was that different from working with Spice? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I was spoiled. <laughs> I was spoiled because working with Spike, oddly enough, man, you know who are the two easiest guys that I ever worked with? Mm. Spike Lee and George Lucas. Mm. George was just like Spike. Mm -hmm. Man, just make it big. <laughs> Say, well, let me play the theme for you. Mm. Okay. All right, that's good. Just make it big. Mm. That was George. Uh, it was rough working with some other directors, mm -hmm. you know, because so, in some instances, I was working with first-time directors. Mm. And working with a first-time director, you know, there were a couple that I worked with, they were tough. Mm -hmm. They were really tough. And I got it because they, uh, they didn't have any experience. Mm -hmm. And I took a lot of it because they were young African-American mm -hmm. uh, directors. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I felt like, okay, you know, any other composer may break their spirit right. in some, in some mm -hmm. way. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to have an educational moment for them. Like somebody took a chance on me. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and then there were some other directors, man. There was one director. This dude was just so anal. Oh, mm. my God. <laughs> you know, um, uh, he was in L.A., and mm. I, would work, I would work in New Orleans, and I would send him stuff. He would send me back these emails of descriptions oh of boy. what he thought of the music. Uh -huh. You ever open an email and a beach ball come up yeah. on your computer? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> that lets you know how yeah. big it was. And man. was, was the, the, so it took him some time to write it, but it was oh. probably pretty a pretty quick response to. And you're like, well, I mean, no, for yeah, I mean, because I mean, I would turn it around. That was, uh -huh. that was just my job. Yeah. But I remember this one instance, man. We were arguing back and forth about mm. a scene, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was one of the main scenes in the film. And uh, it got down to the point where I was like, well, look, man, I'm just, we ain't got no more time. Mm -hmm. I'll see you at the session tomorrow, mm -hmm. and we'll work it out there, yeah. you know. Get to the session, um, and I put up my video, and then we recorded. Mm -hmm. He had been looking at the wrong version of the video. <laughs> oh, man. The entire time. Oh. Yeah. That's painful. Oh, yes, it was. <laughs> so I had, still had to maintain my composure. Yes. <laughs> So there, um, that's the. What about the business side? Did um, how do you manage being a touring 
solo jazz artist and a film composer. Get, and and how, like, I know for myself, sometimes a film will take like three months to score. So it's a big commitment of time where I can't really do much of anything else. And how do you manage that in between um, touring and composing for like the music you're doing to play tonight and okay. all the other obligations you have? Well, yesterday I came here mm -hmm. and talked to the students. Mm -hmm. When I went back to the hotel, I set up my laptop, my keyboard. Mm. Mm -hmm. And this morning I woke up, got back to work and wrote three themes for Spike mm -hmm. and sent them off. Mm. You know, and depending on how tired I am today, mm -hmm. if I'm still up, uh, I'll set up my keyboard when I get back to the hotel mm -hmm. and get back to work. Mm. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's like um, you do it. The, you do it the way you can do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I try to stay organized. Mm -hmm. You know, but right now, me and Spike are in the beginning phases where we just need to deal with the creative side of it, of mm -hmm. what the thematic material is going to be. So some of that gives me a break because I'll write it, but then he absorbs it by listening to it. Mm -hmm. And I know he'll come to New Orleans Monday and he'll say, I like this one, I like this one, this one should be this. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll have that discussion. So I have a day or two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's all, it's all about staying organized. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm on the road, um, I'm way behind on an opera that I've been writing, my second opera. but. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm on the road or at home, man, I just try to maintain a schedule, mm -hmm. you know. And listen, it's it can be done, especially with technology mm -hmm. now, you know, um, the way the Internet works mm -hmm. and the way you can just shuttle things around. You know, I have a Dropbox mm -hmm. that me and Spike share and some other people at his office, so I'm constantly putting stuff in the Dropbox. I'll put it in the Dropbox. I, that's what I did today. Mm -hmm. I put it in the Dropbox, and I said, <coughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I got to come over here for sound check and do mm -hmm. the talk. And it was uploaded. I sent him a text. Hey, man, it's uploaded. He goes, bet, boom. And he'll get it, and he's probably listening to it right now. Mm. Wow. So technology helps yeah. a great deal. Wow. So um, two other questions, and we'll open it up to the audience. Um, uh, what do you do for inspiration? I noticed... Uh, backstage when we were talking, you are an avid sports fan, yes. but uh, so I'm also wondering, what else, is that something that you draw on, or is there other things that are non-musical, like reading books or movies, painters, like what do you look, where do you keep finding inspiration? Oh, in various ways, mm -hmm. you know, uh, my wife's an avid reader, um, you know, uh, my kids are nerds, total nerds, <laughs> uh, my youngest is a She's brilliant, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I do love sports. Mm -hmm. I love sports. I love being around my family, you know. I love getting away from things, mm. you know what I mean? Um, and I think it's always important because I was taught your brain is a muscle just like anything else, and you have to let it relax and reorganize itself. You know, I saw this one documentary about when you sleep, mm -hmm. your brain is actually reorganizing all of the things you, you kind of experience and categorizing and putting mm -hmm. in certain places. So I think that's important, you know, uh, because that, that, that fatigue, that mental fatigue is serious, <coughs> you know, and it can cause a lot of issues and lots of anxiety. So, um, and I learned that from Miles Goodman. Mm -hmm. he, he was working on a film mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had played on it. That's when we met. He called me to play on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody made just like a little offhand comment about the score during a screening mm -hmm. and they threw the entire thing out and they wanted him to write something totally different. Mm. So I called him up and I said, hey man, I'm sorry mm. to hear about this. I said, but it was a great experience working with you. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh man, don't worry, man. I'm in my home out in Durango in the snow. I'm like, what? I'm like, don't you have to get back to work? You? He says, man, it'll get done. It'll mm -hmm. get done. And the way he was so relaxed and mm -hmm. talking about it, I said, you know what? You can't let this stuff upset your life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So. I try to stay organized, I try to stay on top of my game so that I can have those moments mm -hmm. of relaxation to get ready for the next thing. Mm. Okay, last question, this is kind of a light one, but mm -hmm. it's also kind of deep in some way. Louis Armstrong, Went Marsalis, Red Allen, you, what is in the water in New Orleans that makes all these great trumpet players? These days, that's a scary thing to ask. <laughs> <laughs> They've been telling us to boil the water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I don't know. Um, 
I think, I, listen, I, I think New Orleans has always, New Orleans music in general mm -hmm. has always had a very infectious nature to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the, the we're, it's, part, it's Mardi Gras season right now and, you know, so many of those bands, those marching bands will play and people will just join in and celebrating together. Um, and I think that carries over into all different forms of New Orleans music, mm -hmm. you know? So, like, when I hear Pops, that's what I hear. Mm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. um, Leroy Jones, man, he's another great mm -hmm. guy that I, I just love his playing. Mm -hmm. He has that same thing. It's a very passionate kind of sound with wild abandon at the same time, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I just think that's just part of the vibration. That's what Roger my teacher used to tell me. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, the world has different vibrations in different areas around the world. And he said, New Orleans, yeah. this is just the way it vibrates. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And um, so I see it with the young kids that are coming up. It's kind of, it's kind of cute. And I guess people probably thought of us the same way. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I look at some of these young kids, and they're playing Louis Armstrong without realizing they're playing <laughs> Louis Armstrong. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Because uh -huh. it's become such a sound yeah. in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. when, when you say trumpet, you hear this. You're right. Yeah, so it's kind of cool to be a part of that. Awesome. All right, let's open it up to a few questions. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. With Elizabeth, yes. I, I, um, I, I was thinking about the difference between the music you make that's yours, mm -hmm. that where you're gonna, whatever you're gonna do with it, whether you're gonna put it out and play it or whether you're going to produce it, you know, and have. What's the difference for you between that music and when you're writing music for hire? You know, and what's the, and how much, what percentage of each are you doing? And how do you stay motivated for yours? Like, how do you keep that? Well, for, well, the thing about being motivated for my music is just, you know, um, my, I, at a certain point in my life, well, probably at the beginning, actually, of my relationship with music, I've always looked at it as being a, um, like a reflection of the culture that it, from which it was created in. So I've always been kind of socially aware. And um, that's always what an inspiration mostly where the inspiration comes, you know. Um, with this band that we have here, uh, initially we put the band together, well I put the band together because I wanted to inspire young kids who may not necessarily want to play straight ahead but to play on a high level. But while we were doing that, you know, so that was my initial thought, but while we were doing that, you know, Mike Brown was shot, to, uh, Trayvon Martin had already been killed, Tamir Rice was shot, and those are things you just can't avoid. You know, and the thing that was interesting about it for me was, okay, it, it was happening so much, we were getting to the point where we got used to it, you know, and I didn't want to get used to it, and I want to still act like it should be, an, it's an outrage, which it is, you know, so that's the reason why the music, the uh, concept behind the album changed, and the music that we're going to play tonight is based along the same lines, but... Uh, carried further because uh, with the new album we want <coughs> we wanted to continue the conversation because everybody's talking about tweets mm -hmm. you know and some of these issues are very serious and when the athletes try to do it they try to make it about patriotism or try to change the topic and so what we did was we went to four cities where we had violence and it's just not African Americans getting shot mm -hmm. too we believe you know it's gun violence in general so we went to uh, Minneapolis where Philando was shot, we went to Dallas where the police were shot, we went to Cleveland where Tamir was shot, and we went to New York City where other police officers were shot. And we recorded there live, and that's gonna be our next record that's coming out in April. So that music has a certain type of purpose behind it. Now, given that, once, well, the interesting thing about my life, and I'm just not gonna worry because I've been lucky in that regard, is that most of the projects outside of what I do when I'm working at for hire, I still relate to in some way. You know, like Spike's next movie is called Black Klansman. It's about a Colorado Sp Springs cop who joined the Klan over the phone and sent one of his, uh, his colleagues to represent him in all of the meetings. And he became so beloved by talking to these guys over the phone, he wound up talking to David Duke. 
you know, because they loved him so much. And he wound up thwarting a bombing attempt uh, in Colorado Springs. And it never, <coughs> made, it never made the news mm. because they wanted to throw away all of the information to make sure that the public wasn't aware of what was going on. Mm. But that story is something that still means something to me. Mm -hmm. So when, it, when you talk about being inspired, my thing is people need to know that story. Mm -hmm. And not only, should they, not only do they need to know that story, but I want them to feel what I feel when I hear this story. So that, I get, I get excited about stuff like that. So, yeah, and then I did this cute little film called Black or White, you know, about this little girl, you know, uh, of mixed parents. And, um, and I, you can find a certain kind of whimsical nature in the truth that they're trying to deal with in that film. You know, how do you deal with that? You know, the, a child of a, of a mixed couple and a mother who's black dies, and the family still wants to have a relationship with the kid. And the father who's white doesn't mean to be mean, but he's just kind of aloof, dealing with his own issues because he lost his wife. So I try to draw upon the human side of all of the stories that I deal with. You know, I can't, I probably, not probably, I haven't accepted anything that I can't relate to. You know what I mean? I, it's because I think that's where it starts. Uh, you have to have some feeling about about the topic, one way or the other. You know, there are a couple of films, man, that came to me and I turned them down. You know, one of them was so so plain. You know, when I when I read the script, so and I'm not I'm not throwing shade at them because it was funny. There were funny moments in it, but when I read the script, I didn't relate to it. You know, so I said, you know, uh, this is just isn't for me. And, and then the other thing, too, I didn't want to be labeled a black composer. You know, I wanted to be a composer. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to do, you know, the movies that those people mm -hmm. were expecting me to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there one more question? I think we have time for one more. Yes, sir? Sure. Um, I became a fan when I uh, heard you in uh, Mo Better Blues. Oh, okay. And uh, you talked about your early life. Um, uh -huh. And uh, it kind of reminded me of the boy when he was. Oh, window, dude, yeah. He had to practice, yep. but all his friends were out there playing. I was and there when they shot that scene that day. Boy, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, How old? Uh, he, well, he's, he's uh, 20, uh, 19 now. He's at University of the Arts. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, studying uh, composition and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I guess every parent wants their kid to excel mm -hmm. and they want to get and they know the importance of practice mm -hmm. but of course you know you have to be a kid too right. um you know where where do you where would you personally draw the line there um or would it depend really on on the the child it's, it's hard for me to you know i'm gonna tell you why it's hard for me to answer, answer that question man because my father used to make me practice dude I told you, like, he would come home and I hear those keys and I'd be like, shit, there he is. And he would like, come on, you gotta practice. And he would literally sit at the piano next to me. You know what I mean? And he would, he would, he would say, go over that. That didn't sound smooth. Wait a minute, go back, go back. You know, so I hated it. Right, and that's the thing. It led to some other stuff. So when my kids started showing interest in music, I remember my father and I kept saying, I'm not gonna be that guy. Well, I wound up being that guy a little bit, you know what I mean? Uh, not as bad as him, you know? But the thing that I'll say is that what I try to do with students now is to try to push them until they get bit by the bug. And you know when they're bit by the bug, when they're just like, they're just in it and don't realize they are. So my daughter, she's at Berkeley College of Music now, and she's been that way. You know, but before, when she was little, she was playing piano. My two little ones were playing piano. And the littlest one, she was like, nah, this ain't for me. So she gave it up. But the other one, when she stuck with it, then she started to go, she go to, went to the High School of Arts for Music. And she has better ears than me. You know, she can hear anything. Um, and like now, I don't know what's gonna happen to her because she's in school, but she works hard, you know, and she's dedicated, I give her that. You know, she's like in it. Um, and she's having fun and she's being productive. Now, does that, does that mean she's gonna be a musician? I don't know. I have no idea. I hope she does exactly what she wants to do in life. But one of the things that I do know is that because of this experience, she's going to be a productive person, no matter what it is that she does, because she's seeing the benefit of her putting effort into something. 
you know what I mean? And she's gaining something back. She has, a, they have a little band right now. You know, it was so funny, man. She told me and my wife the same thing I told my mom and dad when I was her age. Cause they have a little band that's going on to Texas to play a gig, but they got to drive down. And my wife is like, I don't know if you, I want y'all to drive down. And then she goes, but mom, I have to go on tour sometime. <laughs> And my wife got mad at me because I fell out laughing. I went, wow. Oh, that is so freaky. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I mean, you kind of, you kind of, it's a good, I'll tell you, I'll, okay, I'll tell you about me and my father's relationship. And this is why I felt like I'm probably the success that I am, or I reached the level that I have. When I was playing with our Blakey, and me and our Blakey got into a little tiff about, uh, an issue with the band. Um, he said he was gonna fire me. My father called me up. It's one of those things, you know, sometimes you hear from people in odd moments. And my father called me up, and while he's talking, he can hear that I'm a little depressed in my voice. And I'll never forget it. He said, listen, man, I don't know what's going on, but he says, you're my son and I love you. And if you ever can't take that, you could always come home and there'll never be any questions asked of you. Mm -hmm. And when he said that to me, dude, that empowered me in a way. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, needless to say, art didn't fire me. And things in my life started to turn around because I felt like no matter, I, I said, my thing was, I'm going to go after this because no matter how hard I go, if I fail, my father has my back. And he's, you know. So I, I would tell you, that, that's the best, for me, that was the best thing that I could have heard. And, uh, you know, you just hope for the best. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm, big round of applause for Clarence Blanchard. Thank you.